Well, uh, I'll introduce uh, Sean Gavin, who's going to give us a talk on class. I think the main drawback of class is it re remains, uh, lends itself to a romantic uh, improvement uh, idea of class struggle. And this is usually uh, dysfunctional for the propagandist. Any propagandist worth his salt uh, should address himself uh, to the entire world and have no enemies. But that's sort of perhaps is going to uh, is going to correct that. <laughs> so I'll move that over to you, Sean. Well, good evening, brothers and sisters. <laughs> um, all right. Okay. Comrades, indeed, and comradesses. Um, I, I've been brought here this evening to talk about class. Uh, and I'll begin by saying um, that I will talk about a ruling class, which uh, is, the, in my opinion, the best way to start these things. And I will define a ruling class in... Sorry. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'll start again. I will define a ruling class in our modern context as that group of politicians, bureaucrats, educators, media people, and associated business interests which derive income and status from an enlarged and activist state. Uh, I, I, whenever I give this kind of talk, I do suggest that people should try to forget thinking about the ruling class uh, as a group of people in top hats and bishops' mitres. This was the case at one time, but uh, we, we live we live in changed times, and nowadays it is far better to think of a ruling class in those terms. Now, uh, what defines a ruling class by its activity it is the fact that it is parasitic. It does things because it's a ruling class that would not otherwise be legal. It makes us do things that it would not otherwise be able to make us do. It stops us from doing things that it would otherwise not be able to stop us from doing. It rules us. It uses the power of the state to plunder and, generally speaking, to oppress us. Now, the extent to which a ruling class will carry its plunder and its oppression is determined by a number of forces. There is, of course, the, um, there is the amount of surplus among the people which can be stolen. If you are a ruling class in, uh, let's say, in, let's say, a little corner of Africa, there is a limit to how much you can steal. If you're a ruling class in a, a European or a first world country, the amount that you can steal is considerable. There is also the amount of force that a ruling class can use to impose its power on the ruled. That may also um, very often be limited or less limited. And then Far more important than either of those two, though the other two are, of course, of critical importance, far more important, there is the nature of the ideology by which the ruling class legitimises its existence. Now, because the amount of surplus available does not change very quickly over time, and because the amount of force available may not change very much over time, what is important is the degree to which both rulers and ruled subscribe to the legitimising ideology, and the extent to which the particular ideology legitimises the functions of the state. So far as this ideology is accepted by the ruled, it may well amount to what is called a, a state of false consciousness, in which people sort of think, well, I don't think this is necessarily in my interest to do, but I feel a duty to do it. When that happens, uh, the legitimising ideology becomes a discourse, maybe even a maybe even what may be called a hegemonic discourse. Uh, and there you are. Um, I have used a number of Marxist terms, and I'm sure there are one or two people in this room who are thinking, hmm, have I come to the wrong meeting? 
Uh, you know, you've got someone here rumbling on about class, hegemonic discourses, states of false consciousness, and oppression and plunder and so on. But yes, yes. But of course there are two objections which need to be got over before, as a libertarian, uh, you, you can talk to people entirely comfortably about the notion of a ruling class. The first objection is the one that David will almost certainly make in due course. Oh, by the way, how long have I got? Well, generally speaking, people talk for uh, half an hour, three quarters of an hour, or an hour, okay, or I'll cut a bit it more down. than an hour. Yes, OK. So, uh, as long as you like, really, I suppose. No, no. As long as no. you like. As long as you like. Yes, yeah. that's the point, isn't it? Yes. All right, the first objection which David will surely raise is that uh, the whole notion of class, and especially of a ruling class, uh, it is either illegitimate in itself or does not make very much sense in today's terms. The second objection is that um, the whole thing is Marxist. It, it stinks of Marxism. And is there not some danger that in adopting Marxist terminology uh, and even Marxist categories that we shall, in some sense, cease to be libertarians? Now, let me deal with the... Um, let me do with the first of those objections that the term in itself may be illegitimate. Uh, you might say that, well, there was a ruling class in England in, shall we say, 1605. When Guy Fawkes and his various popishly disaffected plotters decided to blow up Parliament, they could have taken out in one bomb about 700 people. They'd have taken out the king, the, the, the king, the Prince of Wales, the bishops, the, um, the ministers, the lords, the commons, you'd have taken out 700 of the leading people in the country, and these people were a self-aware ruling class. They were often related to each other, indeed they were mostly related to each other. They dressed alike, they spoke alike, they had had a similar education, they thought of themselves as um, a, a, as a semi-closed order. They would refer to each other as persons of quality or simply as gentlemen. They, they washed more often than the people over whom they ruled. They were a ruling class. You could tell that. If you were some, uh, if you were some workman splashing around in a tannery all day and stinking to high heaven of dog's urine, you'd see these people going past in their coaches uh, and you'd have no doubt at all in your mind that these were members of a ruling body. But if you look at um, a country like modern England or modern America or any modern uh, first world country, can you talk in the same way about a ruling class? 700 men, mostly related to each other, with a common education, a common outlook on life, who stand together. Well, yes, I think you can. I think you can. But before, before I come on to that, let me uh, move to the second objection, which is the whole thing stinks of Marxism. Well, yes, it does, and it stinks of Marxism for the very good reason that uh, the Marxists have done far more than anybody else during the past 150 years uh, to, it, to clarify our thinking about class. 150 years ago, 200 years ago, uh, class was a perfectly normal concept used by liberals and classical liberals and Whigs. The uh, wealth of nations is very largely an exercise in class analysis. When Cobden and Bright um, campaigned against the poor laws and, and against various other um, impediments to middle and working class um, betterment, they, they conceived their struggle explicitly in class terms. What has happened, however, is that from the 1870s, certainly from the 1880s, liberals, classical liberals, libertarians, Whigs, conservatives, you call us what you will, you know what I'm talking about, we have, for various reasons, largely stopped talking about class in quite the same way as Cobden, Bright, and the early 19th century classical liberals did. Partly we've done that because of the uh, fatal alliance we made with the landed interest and then with big business. An understandable alliance in the context in which it was made, 
but it is something we need to accept. And so we stopped talking about class at a time when the Marxists carried on talking about it. And so why not use the language? Why, why not borrow the analysis of P, the analyses rather of Marx and Gramsci and Michel Foucault and Althusser and all of the other Marxists and neo-Marxists? Of course, they were wrong in their uh, they were wrong in their overall thinking. And uh, you know, I, I don't know how many people have been murdered in the last hundred years by Marxists, but uh, you know, think of a telephone number and double it. There's something wrong with their overall view of things. But even you know, despite that, they still have something incidentally useful to say. Uh, you could say that uh, you know, astrology is a false science. I, I suspect everybody in this room will agree with that. Uh, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter under which star sign you're born. It doesn't mean that you'll be a particularly benign or sclerotic character. And alchemy is also a false science. Um, you, you cannot turn lead into gold by boiling it in an alembic for three weeks. Um, but even though astrology and alchemy are false sciences, the real sciences of chemistry and astronomy do owe much to the incidental insights discovered by the alchemists and by the astrologers. And so in the same way, I would suggest that although Marxism and neo-Marxism are false social sciences, because because many of their philosophers have been men of considerable ability, indeed genius, and because they have gathered up a number of incidental or perhaps even accidental truths, I feel no sense of shame or no sense of embarrassment whatever in using their language where I think it is appropriate. There is a ruling class. It maintains itself in power largely by the use of a legitimizing ideology. This ideology may amount to a hegemonic discourse in which the ruled will find themselves quite often in a state of false consciousness. There is no difficulty in my mind with using that language. Now let's go back to whether there is such a thing as um, a ruling class in, in today's terms. You might say that, uh, bearing in mind the size and diversity of um, uh, modern societies, you cannot have just 700 men who rule. Well, no, you don't have 700 men who rule. What you do have, however, is a cluster of interests. And you, I don't think it's very helpful to say, well, it's just a cluster of interests. It's like a group of people at a French bus stop, that they all have one purpose in mind, which is get on the bus, but there is no sense of solidarity among them, and as soon as the bus comes along, they'll quite happily put knives in each other's backs to get on first. But I, I do think that a ruling class, or rather a ruling cluster of groups, is rather more united than that. These people all benefit from various forms of state privilege. That, that is what defines them. Oh, and um, sorry, if I could uh, go back to the Marxist point. What distinguishes libertarian and Marxist class analysis is this. Broadly speaking, and I know that it's very difficult to say anything for sure about Marxism, but broadly speaking, the Marxist view of class is that you have a group of people who appropriate the means of production to themselves, and they then set up the state to um, assist in their predations. Whereas if you are a libertarian, you will believe that the state is the only means by which a predatory ruling class can exist. The ruling class does not set up the state to assist itself. The ruling class is enabled to exist by the, ruling, by, by the state. Take away the state and the privileges fall to the ground. Take away the state and there is no means for that regular systematic oppression and plunder um, of, which we can, of which we can accuse that's the ruling class. That's the difference between Marxism, by the way. Marxists agree with that. 
Most of us would agree with that. There are. We yes, have to I do. be no exploitation. That, that's true. It's just a question of uh, which comes first. For, for most Marxists, as far as I understand, uh, the ruling class exists anterior to the state, and the state is the executive committee of the ruling class. Whereas for us, I think, the without the state, there is no ruling class. Without the state, you cannot appropriate the means of production and form yourselves into that kind of ruling class. Now, sorry, go, going back to the um, main point. If you look at um, the cluster of groups who are the ruling class in a modern society, there is a diversity of short-term interest among them, a diversity of superficial interest. Um, Tesco, for example, is not too happy about bans on animal testing. Uh, Tesco is not too happy about um, high taxes on petrol because uh, Tesco relies, or high tax on diesel rather, because Tesco relies on road transport to move its stuff around. Uh, the doctors the various medical guilds, or whatever you want to call them, the medical guilds, let's call them, they want higher taxes on cigarettes, higher taxes on drink. They, they, they want a lot of money spent on health promotion. They want more money spent on their various clients. And, of course, if you are a steel manufacturer or a car manufacturer, you want lower taxes. And if you are an oil company, you, you will certainly not be too happy about all the limits on emissions. Um, there is a great deal of rivalry between the various groups which comprise the ruling class. But there's nothing unusual about that. It is not the case that in 1605 the English ruling class was a monolithic entity. Um, throughout European history there has been a, a general conflict between church and state. For over a thousand years, th these two very important predatory institutions were in competition with each other for who should have final domination over the national mind. But even though, um, e even though these two organisations, church and state, were in conflict, were in competition, they were also always, or nearly always, ultimately aware of their common interest in domination. You always had somewhere at the back of their minds the knowledge that they shouldn't push their competition with each other too far. You, you might stir the people up uh, against one of your more advanced rivals, but you do nothing that will bring down the whole system of church and state. And it is the same in, um, it is the same in most modern societies. Now, I um, spent quite a lot of time with Chris Tame um, doing Forest, the Freedom Organisation for the Right to Enjoy Smoking Tobacco. And the tobacco companies were under a great deal of pressure at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. The, 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 it looked as if the health fascists were getting themselves into a dominant position. And, of course, they were getting into that dominant position. And what Chris suggested on many occasions was, well, let's go all out. Let's, just, let's not use vaguely libertarian arguments about freedom to choose. Let's go all out in an attack on the therapeutic state. And the, the managers of these joint stock limited liability corporations, they smiled, they shook their heads, and they, they backed away from it. They backed away from it for a number of reasons, partly because they were fools, but no. <laughs> no. Um, no, partly because they knew that it would be breaking the rules. They'd be, um, you know, it's not the done thing. Not the done thing to fund that kind of radical attack. 
you use vaguely libertarian language to attack, to undermine the legitimacy of your specific opponents for a specific purpose. But you don't hand over hundreds of thousands of pounds for a campaign, which might actually be rather effective to some degree of undermining belief in the whole system. Because in the long term, all of these people benefit from the same system of exploitation. Now, now you will notice that in this country, it's much the same in America and in, many other, and in most European countries, but obviously I know more about England. What you'll notice is that most politicians in this country, even if they're not related to each other, even if they're not members of what would be seen as the old ruling class, they all begin their career by working as um, PR people or something like that for large corporations. Uh, how did David Cameron start his career? Wasn't it PR man for some breakfast television company? Cold, yeah, something like that. Uh, Peter Mandelson, London Weekend Television. Uh, Tony Blair in some well, uh, what was it? Some chambers somewhere in London, wasn't it? Yeah. You should, yes. Yeah. They all begin their life as interns for the um, corporate in the corporate economy. They then go into politics. They trade favours with their old friends and colleagues and employers in the corporate economy. And then when they retire, they take up well-funded jobs in the corporate economy again. And all through their careers, they will be promoting people from the corporate economy into positions of importance in the, um, in the state sector. They marry each other, they're related to each other, they go to school with each other, they go to university with each other, they have the same, they have the same general outlook on life. They are, I would suggest, a ruling class. Now, now what's wrong with this? You know, what, what's wrong with it? Now, you might say, well, the problem is the state. The state enables a ruling class. As libertarians, we're against the state. So, yes, we're against a ruling class, and uh, that's it. What I would suggest, though, is that um, since we can't get rid of the state in the short term, we need to judge a ruling class pragmatically. We need to look... We need to regard it as more or less illegitimate, not simply because it is a ruling class, but also because of what it does. Now, the old ruling class, the landed aristocracy, the gentry, the... Um, the, the gentlemanly capitalism in the city of London, the, the, the rather nasty capitalism in the north of England, all those cotton mills and uh, screw factories and so on. I wouldn't romanticise them. These were rather hard-nosed people who knew what their interest was, and they were quite prepared to, to tread on anyone who got in their way. At the same time, they conducted themselves within certain limits of propriety. We have a modern ruling class, however, which sees absolutely no limits whatever to its operations. And during the past generation, the new ruling class which has emerged, and, and sorry, um, ruling classes change over time. However, it can be difficult to see that because quite often, it, quite often the same families remain in charge and, and sometimes, if change happens very quickly, the same people will remain in charge. Um, for example, in the early 20th century, people like uh, Keynes and Beveridge, uh, most of the people who laid the foundations of the modern um, managerial welfare state were members of the old gentry or members of the old uh, professional bourgeoisie, the kind of people who'd run Victorian England, what happened was that they gradually adopted a new legitimising ideology, which means that these people 
they still look like the old ruling class. Sometimes they have the same names, they have the same uh, family relationships. David Cameron, for example, if you stuck a wig on his head, um, he would fit very well into any art gallery of uh, luminaries from the 18th and early 19th centuries. D David Cameron cannot be seen as a new man, but what is different is the thoughts in his head. And so these people, they sound like the old ruling class. They speak like, they look like the old ruling class. They, they have often much the same kind of tastes as the old ruling class. But they are different. We have a new ruling class which does not regard itself as in any sense accountable to the people and which has been doing its best over the past 70 years, shall we say, to shake itself free from any degree of accountability to the people as a whole uh, and to move to a system of absolute privilege in, in which um, we shall be completely at its mercy. We have today a gigantic and terrifying police state. I should imagine that if the authorities wanted to know, and they don't, they don't particularly want to know this, if they wanted to know, they could know that this meeting was taking place and they could know who was in it. And they could also work out what time the various people arrived. For example, a couple of days ago, I renewed my tax disc online. I assumed it would be a rather long-winded bureaucratic process. No, I just typed in the registration number of the car, the, uh, the DVLA website then said, yep, you've got a valid MOT and your insurance is valid. What do you want, six months or a year? The whole thing took about 90 seconds. And you may say, good, good, joined up government, joined up government. But I don't know about you, I felt rather scared. I, I just don't like the thought of this. Because um, it is when a government is able to know everything about its subjects that it's able to do the kind of things that you read about every Sunday in the uh, Telegraph uh, in the Christopher Booker column. D did you follow the, have you been following the case of the French woman who came to England with her three children? Yes, yes. Um, oh, sorry, some of you haven't... Let me, let me go through it. Um, she was married to an Englishman. They were divorced, but uh, quite amicable. She came to England with her three children to stay with her ex-husband. One of the children fell down and cut her head. Um, went to hospital, said what happened. Next thing, the social workers were there. The police came in, arrested the mother and the father for negligence and God knows what. The children were taken straight into care and are now being put up for adoption. They're not even British citizens. You're a foreigner. You bring your children to this country and it's quite possible they'll be stolen by the social worker police state. It means that if you are a parent in this country, you are in a state of low-level alarm most of the time. If your child falls down and gets a bruise, you've got to tell the school, stroke nursery, stroke childminder, who may feel obliged to report it to the social workers, who may feel obliged to report it to the police, and it doesn't matter who you are. I, I like to think, well, you know, I'm white, I'm middle class, I know how to write letters, I'm fairly safe, aren't I? I'm fairly safe, but am I? You know, are, are any of us who have children, are we safe? You know, the reason our children haven't been taken away from us is that the social workers haven't decided to do it. Now, that's not a state in which we live. And, and I've concentrated on the child side because it's something I've just drifted into. But I could look at anything, money laundering laws. I, I could look at the way in which your car can be impounded and crushed if you don't renew your tax disc in time. Um, anything you care to mention. Oh, if you've got a brown face and, and you like to run around waving a book very excitedly. <sighs> oh, that's a big no-no, isn't it? Not, not in this country, no, no. You, you, the police may break in into your house and shoot you, and if they can't pin something else on you, they'll say they found um, unclothed children on your computer or something. They did that a few years ago. I never heard anything. I never heard what came of it, but uh, that's what they do. So, 
a ruling class is always illegitimate so far as it operates via the state. Our particular ruling class is more illegitimate than most because it carries its oppressions beyond any limit formerly known in English history. Uh, and so um, what I'll do is I'll close by just giving a, a brief summary uh, of what I think should be done with this ruling class. And, and the answer is that we must smash it. We must destroy it. I don't know how we can seize power. <laughs> I know, that's always the weak point, isn't it? <laughs> it's, a bit like, it's a bit like spending your lottery winnings. Um, everything proceeds very nicely as long as you overlook the initial assumption. If, but, if okay. you wait for failure in a great war, that might do it. Um, yes, I know, but failure in a great war is... It <laughs> doesn't come round to overnight. No, it doesn't. We, we tend to lose all the wars we get into nowadays, but... Uh, sorry, what do you do? You seize power and take for granted that's what you have to do, seize power. You become the new living class. <laughs> you then do what Marx suggested back in 1870 to the, um, to the, to the Paris Communards, you move as quickly as possible to smash all of the governing institutions of the ruling class state. And for a Marxist, it's rather a messy process that involves taking property away from people, ta taking his land away, taking people's um, businesses away, sometimes taking them off and shooting them. But for us, it just means sacking them. It means shutting down all of the institutions through which they operate. You shut down English heritage. You, you shut down the Home Office. You shut down the Foreign Office. You shut down the... You shut down whatever ministry deals with overseas um, foreign aid. You, you shut down ministry after ministry and group within groups. You strip out all of the various um, commissar units throughout uh, public life which, it, which are imposing political correctness at the moment. You just shut them down. You sack these people. You sack them not because you want to save money for the taxpayers, nor because you want to lift a bureaucratic despotism from people's shoulders, though all, both of those things are desirable in themselves. You, you shut these organisations down because you want to smash the ruling class. And you do not simply confine yourself to shutting down organisations like English Heritage or um, fill in the blanks. I um, picked up this story on the Liberty <coughs> Alliance forum the other day. Furious family czar gets £8.6 million pounds in one year and the bulk of it comes from taxpayers. Now, this is some rather well-connected woman whose father got into the um, government-funded training racket back in the early 80s. And her job was to get long-term unemployed people back to work. She hasn't actually managed to get that many back to work, but... Um, <laughs> she's back to work. <laughs> yes. So she's got a side of you, getting people back to work. The woman appointed by David Cameron to get problem families back into work pocketed £8.6 million last year, most of it from the taxpayer. Um, obviously, you shut these people down. You shut down the fake charities. Uh, you, you shut down the quangos, the um, administrative agencies. You cut off funding to formerly private organisations. And, and these cluster like tapeworms and a dead rat around the NHS. All of these organisations which um, provide public relations services or, or um, other kinds of services, new logo design services, um, translation services, outreach coordination services, things like that. All of the health promotion charities and organisations, you shut them down. Um, if they're public, you shut them down directly. If they're private, in quotation marks, you switch off their funding immediately. Um, I would go further than that. I would also bring in... Uh, yes, sorry, I'm a libertarian who's proposing a new tax at the moment. I would suggest a public sector payroll tax, which would, which would make it impossible for anyone employed in the public service to earn more than £40,000 a year. You, 
it doesn't matter, you're paid £316,000 a year um, in some important job. Well, after the public sector payroll tax is imposed, you earn £40,000 a year. That's if you keep your job. Uh, I, would also, I would also apply this to pensions. Now, you need a lawyer here. You, you'd need um, an accountant here to deal with how to do this, but I don't think it's terribly hard to be able to work out how to bleed this creature white. <laughs> Just by using the, the yes, just use just use the tax laws to strip these people naked. Um, when it comes to people like Peter Mandelson, Tony Blair, Neil Kinnock, Chris Patton, uh, and all the other high-level parasites, well, they've all they've all sworn the oath of supremacy, and they've all gone off to work for the European Union, and so they're in breach of their oath, and all of these rather ferocious laws passed by Henry VIII and Elizabeth I are still in force. I would simply use these laws against these people and, again, strip them of their property. You will know that the revolution is succeeding when you see Peter Mandelson behind a cheese counter in Sainsbury. It smells right. Yes. Buying or selling? <laughs> Trying to sell. Trying to sell. OK. But, but I, I could go on with this inflammatory language, all based on the assumption that we can somehow seize power in a moment of revolution. But you get the idea. I do believe... But they, I do believe that it is legitimate for libertarians to talk in class terms because I do believe that there is a ruling class and I believe that this ruling class is more illegitimate in its operations than any other ruling class in English history and I believe that it is our duty so far as we can to destroy this ruling class and it can be destroyed surprisingly easily, assuming that the right people can get into power. Now, um, I I've bounced along from one subject to another, leaving all sorts of assumptions wide open. Um, I haven't, um, I haven't bedded everything in as well as I might, but I think you get the idea of what I'm getting at. So I I'll finish here. And um, I'm sure the demolition can start. Thank you. Any questions? Oliver? Uh, thank you, Sean. I've enjoyed your description of the classics. I've read it. Yeah. In the book, um, How Conservatives Lost Britain and How It Had to Get Back. Um, does not the term the ruling class, which you've, you've come up with, perfectly explain the uh, internet obsession with the Illuminati that uh, all the conspiracy theorists are so <laughs> fond of. If you turn back, you talk about whole families and, and state institutions, and their obsession with this bogeyman of the Illuminati is actually the ruling class that you talk about. Mm. Okay. Um, th there is a ruling class. And I don't think you need to have recourse to theories about um, Illuminati, Jews, Freemasons, and all the rest of it. There's a rather strange American who rings me every so often from New York and tells me that the Cecil family owns the whole of the United States. Now, um, <laughs> Lord Salisbury. Yes, yes. I, I told him he should he should he should be he should feel very happy about that. But uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm not saying that that we are ruled by a secret society. The people who rule this country are the people you see yeah. on television. Well, that's what I'm saying. They're yes. mistaken. They've yes. concocted this bizarre mm. lizard obsess. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> yes, the lizards. The yes. But in fact, what they're, what they're trying to stab at, and they're getting very yes. wrong, is what you talk about. Yes. Is this ruling class? Yes. Um, I mean, there are people in the ruling class we don't see uh, because they work for multinational organisations. Uh, the International Criminal Court, for example, uh, that's a thoroughly nasty organisation, um, which one of Colonel Gaddafi's surviving sons is being done by at the moment. I have no idea who, who runs that. Um, the um, the 
the International Panel on Climate Change run by what's the name Pachauri. We know about him because he's always being done over by Christopher Booker. But th there are people behind the scenes. Um, but by and large, the people who rule our lives are the people we see on the television. But, but there is a ruling class. Sorry, yes. So, Paul. Uh, yeah, um, thanks, Sean. I like that, and um, I agree pretty much with um, with uh, all of that. And the reason I like it is I think it's um, radical uh, without being unrealistic. Uh, I think we, we can deal, deal with David's objections about romanticism later, but um, it's radical. It, uh, it, it cuts to the point of it all. It, Make sure, even though there's the lacuna of how to get the power and you know, smashing the state and mm. things like that. But that, that's beside the point. It's the point is we need to be clear in our minds mm. and clear in our eyes about the nature of the threat, the, the, the predations and abuses of the ruling class. Uh, and we need to be intellectually confident in dealing with them. And I remember somebody, uh, Chris Mouncey, I think it was, who ran some silly organisation calling itself the Libertarian Party it for a short exists. period of time. Mm. He wrote a blog called The Devil's Knife, Devil's Kitchen, something like that, where he spent a lot of yeah. time pouring the most extreme vitriolic abuse mm. all over the politicians. And I thought this is great propaganda, very good, it, it, even though it's all highly unrealistic and glorified and all these silly horror tropes and things that were in it. It was, it was, uh, it was very cathartic. It drew a large audience that it appealed to a big crowd. He got a lot of fun in there. He went on the Andrew Neil show mm. and collapsed like a wafer. At the moment, yes. some of these quotes were read yeah. back to him. Well, Instead of confidently standing up and saying, well, largely this, this, a lot of it is fantasy, but it's a legitimate fantasy. This is how we ought to think about these people. These people are disgusting <coughs> predators, and what I write about them isn't nearly half as disgusting as the things mm. they actually do. He collapsed like a leaf, uh, absolute wet tissue, because he, he, hadn't, he hadn't thought about it. He, hadn't, he was just mouthing off. He was and sober. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's a theory on my lips. Though. Yeah, <laughs> he was just mouthing off, and, and uh, it wasn't even difficult mm. for Andrew Neil to roll him over. And he immediately started playing the game. I oh, will play by your rules. Sorry, mm. I have to be politically mm. correct. I apologise for not yes. being politically correct. Also. These things. Uh, he, he didn't give any kind. Of, I think he would have. He could have got more coverage, more notoriety, and radicalised more people if he stood up to what he said and defended himself. Yes. Well. Um I do have a lot of time for Christopher Mounsey. He, he's, quite, he, he's quite a good friend of the uh, Gab Meek Davis LA, uh, but I do agree that he was not at his best on that Andrew Neil programme. But uh, you know, Andrew Neil is no fool, and he, know, he would be able to do you over and me over and anybody in this room. It's just that he'd do it differently. Uh, but, but I do agree with you that we, we need to get clear in our minds... Or we need to get as clear as possible in our minds the nature of the problem that we face. And I don't believe that it's just a question of bad ideas. Um, I don't believe that it's just a question of um, a, a, a few public choice indicators. I think there is a ruling class which is more or less consciously attempting to enslave us because it is in the interests of these people to do that. But uh, you know, we, need to we need to be quite clear as to who these people are and how they operate. They don't sit around in a room like this saying, well, um, you know, how can we rip the people off a bit more? That being said, having looked at the, the... Sorry, I was just thinking of the banking bailouts a few years ago. Um, I, I withdraw that, yes. <laughs> they, they know what they're doing. They're not rooms like this, they're classrooms. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> nice hotel. Yeah. Yes. Let's chat at the end, first of all, and then uh, Bob, then, uh, and then Andrew. But first of all... Up again. Mm -hmm. um, a few months ago, um, on the Bill Maher show, Andrew, Andrew Breitbart was asked, um, can you be a racist without knowing it? Um, I think Bill Maher was onto something. Um, is it possible that these people who are part of the ruling class are actually not aware of that? Isn't it the case that a lot of these people um, pretend that they are very they are rowing against the tide all their lives. They are um, basically some kind of uh, counterculture 
Whereas what they actually believe, all these kind of cultural Marxist ideas they have, are totally mainstream nowadays. Um, but they still manage somehow to keep this pose of being revolutionaries, of being, uh, of rowing against the tide. And I think a lot of these people that you would, um, I mean, of course, David Cameron doesn't really fit that description, but somebody like, I don't know, David Hare, for example, who is writing this uh, interesting place uh, all the time, mm. I think he believes that he is fighting against um, the forces of evil, and that he's a minority. Mm. Because what he's actually saying is complete mainstream. Um, <clears throat> isn't this kind of a problem that this ruling class we have is not aware that it actually is the ruling class? Um, the thing about legitimizing ideologies is that if sometimes a ruling class will be quite aware of the fact that it is a ruling class. Our present ruling class, however, believes that, as you say, it, it is a group of brave people who are still struggling uh, against um, awful prejudice. Um, which brings me on to a very interesting essay written by an American friend of mine called Keith Preston. Has anyone read it? Uh, should libertarianism be yes. cultural it's leftism? It's day, yeah. Yes, it's a good piece, isn't it? Mm. Um, what Keith has said is that uh, libertarians since the 1960s have broadly subscribed to the idea that, um, that uh, ethnic minorities, gays and women are oppressed groups and that you can measure um, gains in freedom but by looking at how relatively unoppressed these groups are. The, the, the difficulty with this is that um, at the moment ethnic minorities are not oppressed in any meaningful sense, uh, gays are not oppressed and there's no, there, there is no chance in our lifetimes that we'll see anti-sodomy laws coming back and zoning laws to shut down gay businesses. Um, and I, I don't think anyone will take away the vote from women in our lifetime. Uh, at the same time, uh, most feminists are thoroughly statist. Um, the gay establishment figures, uh, Peter Tatchell to some extent accepted, but um, people like Ben Summerskill, thoroughly poisonous statists, demanding all sorts of privilege. And you, know, you, don't need to look, you don't need to talk about the various kinds of ethnic shakedown that we're facing. Um, it doesn't look uh, as though um, it doesn't look as though gay rights, um, ethnic rights, and women's rights have necessarily um, been good for freedom in the general sense. And during the past 30 years that we have become more gay-friendly, woman-friendly, and ethnic-friendly, more touchy-feely about these things, uh, the ruling class has continued to build up a really frightening police state and it is now using enormous uh, amounts of military power all over the world for no apparent reason. Uh, and so, um, well, Keith Preston pointed out that uh, Hillary Clinton is a woman and you saw her virtually having an orgasm over the death of the alleged Osama bin Laden. Um, Condoleezza Rice was the most important cabinet minister in the George W. Bush administration, a black woman. It didn't make that administration any less bloodthirsty. And um, it, it doesn't matter if the people in charge are gay or black or women. What you get is increasingly vicious statism. And so perhaps we need to think again uh, about um, how to measure gains in freedom. The, 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 the yes. gays, the women and the mm. uh, ethnic minorities are conspiring in their own oppression by following the equality agenda. Yes. That's what they're doing. Yeah. Yes. Gay businesses are being shut down because of the equality agenda. Oh, yes. Um, uh, women are being oppressed because of the equality mm. agenda. And similarly the yes, I know. Foreign wars. I know, but it's the it's the people get it. It's the people who are the community spokesmen for these groups. They're mm. the ones. Yes, well, all these groups have privileges as well, don't they, Bob? Um, to what extent... Does the ruling class make use of a ruling ideology? To what extent does the ruling ideology make use of the ruling class? I mean, are these people hypocrites, dupes, true believers, uh, careerists, um, look, looking out for a, a, a fast buck? It's not clear that, um, I think there's a lot of genuine belief mm. in this guff. Others think, well, it's there. How can I make a career? 
yeah. libertarian MP? Ha! So they do something else. Yeah. But I, I do believe there's a, a genuine, quite genuine, lot of, sadly, belief in this foolishness. Uh, true, they don't look at the best of the arguments against their position. They don't seriously set, sit out to say, uh, I, what I stand for have, have been wrong all these years. It's true, it's, it's hard for any of us to do that. And they don't make the attempt. But I do think there's a lot of simple error and not immorality. And the, immor the immorality follows from the error. They think they're doing a good thing. Mm. But I do think there's genuine error. I agree. Um... It is, it is absolutely necessary for a stable and successful ruling class to believe in its own legitimising ideology. Um, one of the objections that uh, I've heard libertarians bring against the idea of a ruling class is the problem of collective action. It's rather like a cartel. If, uh, if the four big supermarkets in this country all decide to set a minimum price of one pound for a loaf of bread, um, they will all smile and nod and wave at each other and then go away and undercut each other in private. And surely uh, this is what makes the existence of a ruling class impossible. The, the reply to that is that um, people will act against their own personal immediate interests if they believe in um, a wider ideology. In the First World War, 10 million young men went more or less willingly to their deaths in the trenches in various parts of Europe. And they did that because they believed in the fatherland, the motherland, the rights of man, or whatever, it, whatever else it was that got them into those trenches. And a ruling class, members of a ruling class, may be rather ruthless behind the scenes with each other, but they will also stick together. They'll take a short-term cut in profits. They'll take um, a short-term reverse rather than um, simply stab each other in the back because they do believe in their own legitimizing ideology. Now it, it is when a rule it is when leading members of a ruling class start laughing at each other and start making fun of their own ideology that you know they're on the skids. Uh, for, for one moment just a quickie. Um, 1784 Beaumarchais' Marriage of Figaro banned in France. Quite rightly, too, because in Act 5 of the play, not the opera, Figaro turns on the Count and says, well, you know, you've, you've got land, you've got money, you've got status, you've got admiration, you've got everything. But what have, you done to, what have you done to earn all this? You took the trouble to be born, and that was it. And um, the royal censor, the French censor, said, no, can't, no, you can't, no, 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 can't. And so a group, of, a group of leading young aristocrats decided to put the play on in the Royal Theatre in Versailles, which was not subject to the state censorship. And everyone thought, oh, you know, how very daring, how very risque of these people. Yes, it's when you stop believing in your own ideology that um, a few years later you, you find yourself looking up at the blade of a guillotine. Sorry. Sorry. Um, uh, no, David. David's at the back of the long queue, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. Sorry about that, David. Uh, Deathless. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, well, I guess, Sean, every ruling class does rely on sort of the legitimizing ideology, but, you know, they need also to rely on the fact that the broader public subscribes to that ideology. Mm. So I would say, so, so my question is, how come the public accepts that ideology today? I mean, obviously, most people would think, the wider public, I guess, thinks that all these things, like the NHS, you know, the big state, the, the, even the police state, is, is for our safety. It's, it's, you know, many people would probably say we, we, need, we need many of these institutions. Uh, I can only assume, because if the wider public would not subscribe to that ideology, wouldn't they revolt? I mean, I, I don't know, is that not the angle in which sort of the libertarian idea could be spread in convincing a broader section of the public? I suppose so. It's just that most people take their, uh, they, they take their ideas of what is right and proper from um, their superiors. We are hierarchical animals. They, they are elites. And... Um, I'm wearing a pair of shoes at the moment with um, laces. 
There's no reason why I should wear lace-up shoes. It's just mm. that it's the done thing. Why is it the done thing? Because I've been told it's the done thing. Uh, and most people accept that uh, the National Health Service is a right and proper way to deliver health care because they've been told it by their superiors. Uh, and most people believed... I, I believe that even in... Right through, the, right through the five years afterwards, most people in this country believed that the British government was right, broadly speaking, to join in the invasion of Iraq. They didn't do that because they had carefully considered the arguments, but simply because they were told it was the right thing, but by their leaders. I, I have no sense whatever of colour. And when it comes to matters of internal decoration, virtually anything like that, I follow the advice of um, a certain person uh, who, who has a great deal of authority over me. And um, most people out there don't think, not because they're stupid, but because they don't want to think. Thinking is a waste of time. They have other things to do with their lives. Just in the same way as I don't think too much about the right co about, about whether these two colours in the bathroom clash or in harmony. I can't be bothered. And I will simply take it from somebody else who, who says it with a certain authority. These colours go together. Those colours don't go together. Uh, and in the same way, most people in this country accept that this is the way the country should be run. Not because they're stupid, but because most people are group animals and they take their lead from, from the leaders. And, yeah. um, so psychology has a lot to do with Hang it. Hang on, you're next, Andrew. Oh, sorry. If the, uh, if the ruling class starts to fall when <coughs> it ceases to believe its own ideology, then it's what we need, not a, uh, a, a, a lottery win of uh, somehow finding ourselves in power but to convince the ruling class of their, the falseness of their ideology. Yes. I suspect, however, well, there are many approaches, and yes, one way is by publishing long books saying, you're wrong. Uh, what you... you it doesn't follow from this. What, what you say doesn't follow from your premises. You are wrong. This is the better way of doing it. Um, Another line of attack, however, is just to denounce them as parasites and, and keep on. Um, this sort of story about the woman who's, who scooped £8.6 million pounds from the taxpayers, and that's just for this year, by the way, um, that sort of thing needs to be waved around. There was... Oh, it's the... Um, the chief executive of Kent County Council, because I live in Kent, I pay attention to these things, she was taken on for 18 months. Um, when she resigned at the end of that, she got a £350,000 golden handshake. Uh, she was on £240,000 a year salary, and her pension fund was um, knocked up to a million pounds. Um, that was all for 18 months of work. The, the, if you read the Richard North blog, you see this stuff again and again and again. You know, these people are looters and it needs to be rubbed under their noses as often as possible. That although they talk about the, um, the, 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 no, the, the ennobling aspects of public service, they're doing extremely well from it. And we should also be demanding our money back in various ways. Lady? No? You, you can speak now. Basically, in this country, okay, I like, I like your use of the ruling class, but at the same time, it kind of negates um, the possibility of perhaps class mobility. I, I believe a lot of people in this country are kind of, kind of grow up in a way that, oh, it won't happen for you, whereas in countries like America, they grow up in a way, oh, you could be the president of America if you want to. <coughs> perhaps uh, using and clinging to, to these terms as if they're immovable and there is no chance of class mobility, kind of um, takes the power away from the people and um, the hope. And instead of waiting for the ruling class to decide on their own that they're irrelevant, you know, the people can decide the ruling class will have no, no one to rule over if um, the people do not want to be ruled. Yes, an effective ruling class will always have some mechanism for recruiting outsiders of ability. 
I won't go into all the details of how it happened in the past in England. You'd make a huge fortune um, screwing your workers in Birmingham, and then you'd marry your daughter to the son of the Marquis of Flopshire or something. Uh, but um, every ruling class has some means of recruiting people of ability to itself. Um, well, I, mean, I mean people like self-made millionaires. Well, they usually find themselves sucked into the ruling class. It's quite unusual for a very rich person to be not only outside the ruling class, but antagonistic towards it. I'm not saying it's impossible, and it does happen, but um, the, there are general mechanisms in any country for people who have displayed ability as it's generally recognized to, to be co-opted uh, in those countries where in those countries where the class barriers have come down very sharp and it's difficult for ability for able outsiders to get in th then the ruling class itself after a few generations will begin to crumble but but uh, talking about America yes anybody in America can become president uh, as long as he has uh, five as long as he can lay hands on 500 million dollars um, no, I, I, I meant more the psychological mm. aspect mm. of the way you grow up and mm. where, where and whether you feel like you have uh, opportunities mm. to you know move. Americans have more op uh, Americans have more opportunity than we have in this country, but I would not call America in any sense a classless society. Uh, and and I, I don't think that social mobility is notably greater in the United States than in the United Kingdom. No, can I ask you something yes. else? How do you think, um, because there's a lot of negative um, connotations to the word capitalism, and because we're all here, you know, free market mm. and stuff, and, and there's all this movement among young people, mm. and they don't know, and they accuse capitalism for what is happening, when actually it's the state and, and, and tax system bailing out, you know, these people that made a lot of mistakes. Mm. How can we... Um, teach these, well, you know, get, get rid of the nasty connotations around the word capitalism. We don't live under capitalism. Well, it's obvious when the taxpayers are bailing out the big banks. Big arguments about that at the moment, which you'll see. No, the big arguments about this, which you'll see echoed on the Libertarian Alliance blog, um, that there are some people who say we should we should embrace the word capitalism and we should purge it of its negative connotations. Other people say we should just abandon it and just talk about freed markets or, or free markets. But um, I, I don't know. It's, it, it brings us onto a whole different area. Rule, it does, yes. Actually believe, and yes. Would have been here yes. Don't. Yeah, but what, don't actually know what capitalism is. What a person believes one minute, they don't necessarily believe the next minute. Do you? Yes. Um, I, sure. I'd like to say, um, but that I think there's a, a possible transition in what you've been talking about. On the one hand, you have, I think, a, a conscious debauchery of the state that has taken place over the last four years people who know what they're doing, who have effectively seen the financial crisis and have undertaken the bailout of the banks because they thought the alternatives was too frightful for them. On the other hand, you've been describing, which I'm not sure so much as a ruling class, as a, as a ruling process, which seems to be more indicative of the, the rise of public sector professionals over the last 40 years. Their nurseries and the universities coming through, extending their, their rule, their process, gaining money from the state and so on. And, and that's why I have difficulty when you say ruling, ruling class as opposed to ruling professions, for example, because I don't think they're a coherent body. And I think in some senses, you may well find that they're, they're quite complex and quite um, conflicting in, in mm. their in their attempts, you know, to describe, um, mm. you know, some people like uh, the the cynical KPMG consultant who know he's gouging the state, mm. with the social worker who thinks they're doing good by kidnapping French children, um, and yeah, there are some of these misguided individuals out there who actually think that they do believe that they are still engaged in some form of public service. Mm. Even Brown thought he was engaged in public service. Mm. Yes. He was the leader of this whole edifice. Mm. So, have we moved to a stage in the looting? 
because I, I, I mean they are not a very good ruling class. They seem to be killing the goose that made the mm. golden egg. Have we moved to the looting stage now? Do you see any hope in the sense that they're they're so far gone in their depredations that perhaps they might be uh, they might uh, effectively be killed by the bond market or some other ferocious creature? I had an argument with Nigel Meek a few days ago. Um, I referred to the RAF as William Hague's death squads, <laughs> um, and Nigel took issue with that. Um, and I, I realised, I, I realised with a sudden shock that I no longer felt, I no longer feel very patriotic, and. Th that is something I find rather alarming because I've spent most of my life jumping up and down with a Union flag in each hand and I no longer feel any sense of identification with the British state. I no longer feel any fellowship with our armed forces. I don't feel any sympathy with soldiers when I see them on railway trains. Um, the becoming a libertarian. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. The transition from the libertarian to the libertarian. Yes. Um, I'm sure this is something that will pass, but I, I do agree that... Uh, uh, well, not... not, not uh, something you'll get to the other side and yes. you become an anarchist and then yes. that'll be a, yes. a change in life. Yes. Um, yes, I, I do appreciate that, but um, I, I do agree that the ruling class we have does it, it looks it looks more like a group of asset strippers um, the, the, these people are pretty awful i don 't know what will happen. Um, it may be that we 'll move fairly quickly to, a, to some kind of libertarian reconstruction, and in five or ten years' time we 'll all sit here a bit older saying. If only we'd realised then. And some say, oh, I knew it would happen. I knew it. I always knew it would happen. Look, I said this on a blog. But I suspect that won't happen. I suspect that what will happen is that we're heading towards a fiscal... Uh, we're, we're heading towards a set of interlocking crises which will look insuperable, but which will just sort of be muddled through and the ruling class will survive and possibly there'll be a bit of improvement and it will just drift on towards some terminal crisis in 30 or 50 years' time. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Um, I agree with your analysis of the ruling class... Uh, how the ruling class maintains its power. I also agree with your analysis, if the libertarian movement is to gain power, how we will smash the ruling class. However, how do we ensure that the ruling class does not re-emerge, re rebuild itself? How do we ensure that it's consigned to the dustbin of history? I don't know. And, of course, in all the things I've written, I've insisted that all I want to do is sack these people and take away their money. I don't wish to use violence against them, but then all revolutionaries start off by saying that, don't they? Um, no, no. I don't actually want to shoot anybody, but the problem is the kind of people who would do our bidding in a libertarian revolution would not be so scrupulous. And what certainty is there that we could um, get our revolution, and what certainty is there that the revolution would not be betrayed? Looking over the past 400 years of experience of revolutions um, for various purposes, it, it doesn't look very good, does it? It talks about it like the experience of God, you know, yes. the experience of revolution is non-existent. Uh, now, it's uh, Andrew first. Okay. Um, I, I, as a past recipient of bonuses from Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, I can perhaps give some insight into the psychology of a looter. Uh, <laughs> when the times are good and the money is going, then you know it's maybe a bit dodgy, but it's going around and mm. you get yours. When times are bad, and the money might not be coming anymore. The morality just doesn't appear anymore. Mm. My, my, my little boy might lose his horse. Mm. Uh, and you kind of lose sight of everything else. It's, well, I have this stuff and I could lose it. And you're defending what you have. And maybe when you got it, you knew it was a bit dodgy. But now it's yours and you have to keep it. Mm. And whatever it takes. And this just cannot be allowed to fall. Oh, I, I agree with you. That's an analysis of how 
most people most people operate w when times turn hard. So when people ask, you know, what, what, do, do they know they're looting or do they believe the ideology? When, when they're getting there through their 8.6 million, mm. they perhaps know they're looting. When their, when their system is under threat and they're defending it, that's not really on the table anymore. No. I, I think um, because, we are, because we are herd animals... I, I think one of the reasons why um, you see so much looting further down the chain is because you read about this and you simply say, well, if they're doing it, why shouldn't I? Look, if uh, you know, how did Peter Mandelson manage to buy a, an £8 million house in central London? How on earth did Neil Kinnock and his family make a million pounds a year? It can't have been by entirely reputable means, so why shouldn't I take a few bribes? Why shouldn't I do a bit of skimming off here, there and everywhere? I, I think that's one of the reasons that explains why the... Um, why the enforcement authorities are behaving with such um, with such almost hysterical um, nastiness. Um, you know, a police officer will smash the door off your car because you might have been using your mobile telephone. Um, there was a case a few days ago. Oh, there's always cases. Um, there was a there was a, a Calvinist preacher in Welling a few years ago who let his children climb up onto the roof of his house, and there were um, there were police officers and social workers in helicopters descending from the sky and arresting everyone and taking them into care. The reason they do this is because they see the big people behaving like fascist scum and so they think that's how they should behave we take our lead from the people in charge and one of the reasons why life in England is becoming so unpleasant nowadays is because of the examples set by our rulers Just up at the back then Oliver and then Bob <coughs> You said the ruling class is driven by an ideology um, but I think when you try to fight this, I think um, it's dangerous to mistake what they are kind of ruled by, to mistake that for an ideology, because I think it has more characteristic of a religion. Um, they believe in these things um, quite deeply and truly against all evidence. Mm -hmm. um, they would never um, basically, I think these social workers, they really believe that they are doing good. And although um, they should be able to see that what they're doing is actually very beneficial for the children, they kind of rationalize this. When you always have a religious belief, you will always kind of, in a way, rationalize it to yourself against against all reality. Mm. Isn't this um, the, their strongest force for the system to stay as it is? Oh, yes, you must believe in the system. The moment people stop believing in the system, the system crumbles. And I don't yes, see, absolutely. I, I don't see... I mean, th there are various crises of legitimacy brewing around the edges, but the overall system appears to be quite stable in the ideological sense at the moment. It needs to be, because it's a system we're going to have in the Oliver? Yeah, uh, just, just to say that um, another way of attacking the situation is probably not going to lead a military coup next week or next month or any time soon. Another way to um, destroy or at least attack the ruling class is um, by mockery, um, mm. by demotivating them. Mm. In fact, every time you come across a state official, demotivate them in some way, um, destroy their morale in the way that you can. Uh, Spitting Image didn't bring down Thatcherism, but it did, did destroy David Steele's career mm. because he was mocked. And uh, that's the one thing that people can't stand to be mocked. Oh yes, yes. And it's the one, it's the one weapon which is highly effective. Is mockery. I guess the Nazis and communists weren't stupid when they made um, humour into a criminal offence. Um, I mean, what is it, in the Soviet Union, you could be sent to a labour camp for 12 years for telling a joke and for six years for hearing the joke and not reporting it and so on. Um, no, you're right. Um, <laughs> The more insane and oppressive a ruling class may be, the, the less it can stand any kind of mockery. The old ruling class in England could put up with any amount of mockery because um, 
Well, it wasn't really that bad. It, it, I mean, if you um, give or take a few accidents like the First World War, the, the older... Inc- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll... Uh, Details. Yes, 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 yes. Sorry, I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, you have another go. Oh, sorry. Oh, very yes. no, David uh, has been... I was foolishly I've looked at David. Yes. Oh, that's good. We need to, because he's... I mean, he's, he's better than me. Mm. An important part, I think, of what you're saying, Sean, is, uh, is the... We should be attacking those who are called the looters. We should be denouncing those who are uh, benefiting themselves. Now, my concern about that is... is it's very easily perceived by others as an attack on those who abuse the system. And the problem with that is that it's then taken to be an attack on abuse of the system. Mm. So that mm. what we are seen to be doing is we're saying, well, it's a terrible thing to abuse the system because by implication, there's nothing wrong with the system. The bad thing is the woman who takes six million pounds a year out of the system. It's not a problem with the system, it's a problem with her. Mm, uh, uh, and what bothers me slightly is, is that taking this stance almost risks conceding the, legit- the legitimacy of the system and perhaps over focusing on those who are taking advantage of an otherwise sound system. Oh, that's it. But of course, um, I, I, I'll say, no, I, I must emphasise that um, I am not calling for a uniformity of libertarian strategy and tactics. Some people will, um, some people attack this woman for taking, what is it, £8.6 million and abusing the system. Other people attack, will attack the system that allows her to take £8.6 million. Some people will spray vicious satire all over these people. Other people will sit down and in rather flat German voices will explain that um, you know, it, it's all to do with the economic calculation argument. Mm, good. We shall... Yeah, uh, the right lines. Okay. <laughs> so, long as, you know, so, so long as we're all attacking the right people, it doesn't matter how we do it. Oh, sorry, um, as long as we don't send them letter bombs, that, that's quite, quite. something that we should try to avoid doing. Um, so I'm saying that for the camera. <laughs> uh, no. No, no. It's the sort of thing that blows up in your face. Yes, it, it is, yes. <laughs> no, no. The, it depends. It, it de- what, what we should be... What we, I, I suggest that we should be trying to delegitimise and therefore bring down the system. Now, how we do it depends on which side we go out of bed in the morning. Um, if you don't have any great talent for satire, don't try doing it. Um, use denunciation instead. If you're not too good at um, old-style religion denunciation, um, try calm reasoning. Do whatever works for you. Hmm. I, I spoke of the true believers earlier. Perhaps we should come from the other direction. And um, Instead of trying to destroy the ruling class, to enrage the ruled, hmm. yes. to get them... Well, I'm um, ungruntled. Uh, Rousseau said somewhere, a man I particularly despise, <laughs> you know he's dead. He said, um, if you tell a man he can better himself, he goes, mm, he won't, won't pay any attention. If you tell him he's wronged, yeah. then he pays attention. Mm. Yes. So if you tell people how much they're screwed around, mm. then the ruling class might cling to their ruling beliefs, they might mm. believe in their ruling beliefs. But if you point out to those who are ruled that they're not gaining from it, Mm. The sufferers from it, mm. you may see a movement. It wouldn't matter too much about the rule at that point, because the rule would be on the run. Yes. They may try harsh measures, but at that point, the harsh measures may make things worse. Yes. For them. Yes. Um, if I could continue with that, I remember about 15 years ago, Jan Lester. Um, suggested that what we should we should move towards various kinds of direct action and one of the things you suggested was that we should take ourselves down to King's Cross and interpose ourselves between um, prostitutes and arresting police officers and I thought at the time I well, have no recollection <laughs> well, turn that to be a cop though, but... not doing it oh re- rest assured oh, rest assured you did <laughs> yes. but and I thought at the time oh I don't fancy doing that and you know, quite obviously 
you didn't fancy doing either. <laughs> but there may be people out there who do like to do that sort of thing, who aren't terribly interested in writing pamphlets and blog postings, but are interested in... Um, in embarrassing the authorities, just as um, every so often I, I don't look on YouTube as often as I ought to, well perhaps I'll look far more often than I ought to, but um, every so often I come across um, videos that people have shot of police officers behaving in their usual pig-like fashion. Um, and uh, it's not something that I would want to do because I don't want to have a truncheon um, brought down on my head. but. Obviously, there are people out there who like to follow the police round and just film them and insist on their legal right to film them. And good luck to them, I say. I don't plan to do it myself, but I certainly wish the very best to everyone else who wishes to do that. In the same way, there are, there's a whole range of anti-statist strategies or delegitimization strategies, um, which I either don't know about or don't like the sound of. But um, you know, if, if, it, if that's the sort of thing you like, you do it. And also the people control the press these days through Facebook and all, and all mm. these things, you know, instead of waiting for the news to come to you to control the Oh, yes. Just into you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the, um, despite the state being the size and frightening capacity power it has now, it now has new soft underbellies that the state historically hasn't had before. Mm. So, for example, uh, Britain's a very peculiar instance of this. Its IT infrastructure is extremely vulnerable to attack. It makes a, a complete joke of our foreign policy because so many computers in the public sector run a combination of Windows XP and Internet Explorer 6, which oh. is the most easy combination to hack. Right. If I worked for the Chinese intelligence agency, if I wanted to save all those Britain, that would be my first point of attack. Yes. That's true. Um, someone told me during the riots last summer that uh, this exposed the soft underbelly of the state, the fact that it couldn't, um, it couldn't contain the rioting in more than two or three places. Um, and yes, it did. O on the other hand, what these people are now doing is looking for um, more and more intrusive and total ways of keeping an eye on us. So um, the, the state is weak. We know that it's weak in the physical sense. We did see last summer that there was a breakdown of state authority. Um, now, be because I was watching this from a very, very safe distance, um, I, I could look at it with a great deal more detachment than many people. And I was interested in how they lost control. But... Um, that sort of thing doesn't happen very often. And the kind of control that the state exerts over us usually doesn't involve um, constable, constables with truncheons. It's mostly brown envelopes in the post. That's what frightens me. If, um, if a police officer comes up to you in the street and screams at me, I, I'm quite convinced that he won't kill me. But um, when I get those brown envelopes in the post in the morning, my, 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 my heart turns over. And that's how they control us. And there's not much we can do about that, is there, in the short term? You can't go and burn the tax office down. Just a question. Yes. Just to follow up on that, one thing you can do is to do it at most to not to pay so much taxes and have other people not to pay so much taxes, but using cash or only, for example. Yes. Well, once you get into the once you get into the area of um, arranging your affairs uh, so that you pay as little tax as possible, um, you, of course you need to be very careful when there's a video camera. But yes, yes. Obviously. Yes. Yes. I mean, the state may be much weaker than I assume. Um, and something to bear in mind is that on the edge of every... If you look at the English Revolution of the 1640s or the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution, um, on the eve of all of those revolutions, the established order seemed to be far more solidly based than had been the case in the recent past. In, um, sometime in 1640, the Archbishop of Canterbury wrote a letter to Charles I saying, I have never known the people more 
meek and subservient in the face of established lawful authority than they have been of late. Uh, and this was about three months before the calling of the short parliament. Um, equally, I'm, I'm sure that in the late 1780s, many French people assumed that um, whatever problems the French monarchy had faced earlier in the century were being, were being dealt with. Uh, and so on the edge of every revolution, the, the established order has never seemed so solidly based, yet it collapses at the first shock. Uh, and perhaps that's, that, that's the kind of situation in which we are now living. Perhaps this could just fall to pieces over three or four weeks, like uh, communism fell to pieces in Eastern Europe in, in a couple of days. But um, it, it might go on for 30 or 50 years. Paul? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm sure the established order could be made to fall uh, rapidly and violently, um, but it will just be a rapid and violent change, most likely, uh, as opposed to the sort of we, we have. We don't. We in in this country, we've avoided the abrupt kind of revolutions that they've had in other countries. Mm. And we've had more of an evolution of the state. In other countries, they've had the abrupt violent revolution. The old order has come crashing down, only to be replaced by a whole load of new mm. grafters and predators and power seekers and that in the new ideological clothes. So it's not just a matter of attacking the existing ruling class. Mm. Ghastly, there they are. Uh, it's, it's the idea of rule in general that needs to be attacked. And um, you're right to say, because we're all inclined to do different things, and marvellous there would be if we all went and flash mobbed police trying to arrest prostitutes in mm. King's Cross and things. None of, us, none of us can be bothered to do that sort of thing. Um, we might be able to trick a few young people to do it on Twitter or something if we were so inclined. But, um, but the point is, it's, it's the idea, it's the ideology that is the main thing. You know, it, it's um, you can say we can all do different things, but it's the, it's the it's the ideology of freedom. There's got to be something a bit more positive as well than just attacking mm. the attacking the thing we want to see fall because it will, we know what happens. It falls and it's just replaced by mm. something else. Mm. The czar fell and it was replaced by something worse. Um, no doubt that in short order, uh, Bashar al-Assad will be hanging from a light, uh, hanging from a lamppost, or being, you know, anally raped by a bayonet to death, like mm. Colonel Gaddafi, or some such thing like that. Is in store for him in the short order, but something equally or more dreadful will will come to pass. And it's the same thing in, in this country. We can all cheer. You know, we can all cheer as we stamp our heads on you know, David Cameron and, or Tony Blair or whichever mm. of the the current bogeymen that there are. But it's it's what replaces it's what replaces it. And revolution is just it's just fast. We've avoided the violent revolution, mm. um, but we've had an evol evolution instead. But whichever way it's done through evolution or you know, evolving circumstances or or revolution, it's changed towards a libertarian, a freer, a non-ruled society. That's mm. what we need. So it's, it's, we need to focus on a little bit more than just attacking the yes. the ruling class. Bob. So, sorry, did you want to try to? No, no, I think well, I it's agree with everything Paul said. Yeah. No. There is hope. Um, lots of people I, I see are obvious libertarians who've never heard of me, bastards, mm. never thank any of us, mm -hmm. don't even know us. Mostly, I get this impression, genuine impression, I think uh, a correct impression, through um, uh, anti global warming sites, mm. let us call skeptic sites. These people, some of them have just done American uh, Republicans. I mean, they're plainly uh, libertarian, in mm. essence. Because they <coughs> see, on a small form, this thing, which is not simply a scam, not simply fake, there's genuine belief, genuine careerists, mm -hmm. those who think, well, there might be something in it, or even if it's not true, it's something we should be doing sensibly anyway. All of the arguments that are very akin to the arguments for a state. Mm. So the arguments for a state intervention in this area, being so shallow, so silly, so seemingly lacking in evidence, has produced a, a well, in my lifetime, I've never seen so many people who are always libertarians in this area, and uh, we obviously see the libertarians in, in, in every other area too, pretty much. Mm. But it is good to see that um, without revolution, uh, in that sense, without politics in a way, just by informing each other, just by reading each other's stuff, mm. we see that there is 
a revolutionary insight, a revolutionary mentality. It's not violent, it's not, it's just dismissive. Hmm. It reads the opponent's stuff and thinks nothing of it. It reads it seriously, it takes it hmm. seriously, de de demolishes it. Yeah. And that's very encouraging. Sadly, they, could, they should praise us all, <coughs> never yeah. us, but never mind, they are libertarians. Yes, I, I, I agree with you. Um, one of the difficulties with the environmentalists, however, is that the, the, there is, sorry, the, the global warming hypotheses tended to dwarf all of the others, and it has become um, so well known, uh, and also the fact that it is untrue is also becoming generally well known. But um, th these people are a cluster of interest groups. Look, look in, my, in my political lifetime, we've had nuclear winters, we've had acid rain, we've had uh, global warming, we've had, uh, what else have we had? Global cooling. Ice age. Global cooling. Oh, it's the ice age, yes, I remember, ages. yes. Um, but this is the nature of science. Science oh, will always be like resource, that. Resource depletion. Always be like that. Yes, resource depletion. My English teacher came into, came into the class in 1974 and chalked up on the board a list of um, raw materials with the date of exhaustion. Yeah, and I, yeah, yeah. Gold was 1984. <laughs> now, um, you, yes, but the point is, all of these after the event are, are ridiculous. Oh, acid rain. They're all, they're all stupid. They're, they're all exploded. But the environmental movement keeps ozone. moving on. Ozone. Yes, ozone, ozone depletion, mm -hmm. yes. All of these things, um, they, they fall to pieces after a few years. But the, um, the kind of religious mentality uh, behind them just finds something else. So as soon as, look, they've given up on global warming effectively. It's now climate change. Indeed, I think it's now called... Um, disruption. Global climate that's disruption. That's it, global climate disruption. And it's if that science. falls down... Sunny weather. Yes, if that moves on, science. they'll move to <laughs> asteroid impacts. Asteroid impacts. Remember that? Remember how that got pushed about 20 years ago? Um, that wasn't the Greens. That was all the people who wanted to keep the nukes going. But um, there's an almost infinite range of um, environmental disasters which can be uh, which we um, which we raised. It's just, it's yeah, just science. So. First of all, it's got yes. to be pathos. You mean it's wrong? Pathos? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Science. Yes. Is he there? Science. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't <laughs> go on too long. It's inside. Yes. Oh. Um, yeah, just, just to come back quickly about the ruling class, which you, you think you've pinned down when you mentioned a few politicians who've been hiding in their pockets. Well, I mean, that's the thing you... Uh, uh, politicians always be hiding in their pockets. Mm -hmm. White-collar crime and so forth. Um, I wonder if you really have been, uh, narrowed down the ruling class. Um, just a couple of simple examples. Um, come back to, to the uh, environmental example. Um, if you look at the huge wind farms that appear right across the UK now, and even offshore as well, on the seabed, um, huge numbers, even in the Thames estuary. I mean, the people behind this uh, extracted a fortune, landowners, who had money from the EDC to build these things, the whole infrastructure. They get money for producing electricity. And even a, a fantastic amount of money, even if they don't produce any mm. electricity, mm. Well. if you read the contracts, they're quite staggering. But apart from the politicians involved and the accountants and directors of the companies who have read in this kind of thing, the real people behind this are completely invisible. We don't know. Mm. Well, that's just one example. Another example, Iran, mostly forgotten about now. People talk about the politics about blame. The actual oil fields have passed over now to the Rothschilds. And they're in charge of the, of the most of the Iraqi oil now. But how that process happened, the politics involved, the accountants, again, the directors, and such, we don't know anything about that. It's completely invisible. And it's something which 
is never in the newspapers. Mm. But it's happened. And uh, oddly enough, you, the, the chap, um, um, Hay Haywood, who was in charge of the um, BP oil spill. Oh, yes, yes. He's actually one of the captains of industry for the Rothschilds now in Iraq, believe it or not. But a lot of this stuff is, is simply invisible. I mean, we, what's correct to us is the crooked politicians who are lying in their pockets, and you, you know, some of them which you don't mind. Um, I know that's, I mean, that's going on, and always will go on, um, but I'm not sure that you've really nailed down the, the ruling class. I, I suspect that what we discussed at the very earliest but there is another class behind mm. it. And it's probably tied in with, uh, dare I say it, a lot of sort of clandestine organisations like the Masonic Lodges, uh, perhaps there's some quasi religious organisations involved, mm -hmm. synagogues, uh, all kinds fun. of uh, organisations which <laughs> cosy up to each other. and this is behind the scenes. If I could, um, if I could intervene, what you've... Um, yes. no, 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 no. No. You don't need to sum up. No, no, no. I, I think one of the issues you have... I think one of the issues you have raised that um, is legitimate is the way in which... Um, individual shelter behind various kinds of corporate personality. And it might be very useful if we could, um, if we could strip away the corporate veil that, that um, covers many people. At the moment, um, we talk about Shell Oil or British Petroleum or um, Tesco or Sainsbury or think, Goldman Sachs or um, National Westminster Bank or Citibank or what have you. Uh, it would be very useful if we could strip away those various corporate veils and see the people themselves behind it, and also to make these people subject to uh, various kinds of action for, the, for their own defaults. Uh, I, I do think it's, a, it's another subject entirely, but um, I, I do think that uh, the Joint Stock Limited Liability Organisation was a, a serious mistake in the history of bourgeois civilization, and that if we ever do have a libertarian revolution, then we should, um, even if perhaps we do not do away altogether with corporations, we, we should um, place a great deal more reliance on on various kinds of um, sole tradership, partnership, cooperatives, organisations where you can see who is exercising the power and who has the money. Whereas at the moment, there is this giant corporate plutocracy. And although I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with you about the nature of the people behind them, we really do not know in most cases who is behind all these things. But that's not because it's secret, it's because it's not reported. It's because... Which I, I, I yes. agree is a fine distinction. Yes. And, and a oh, no, it's the nature. It's, it's the nature of the organisation. Um, when share ownership is divided up and... Um, when it's all fractured and repackaged in the ways that it is, it is often very difficult to know who owns it. You see, a while ago I was discussing um, default on the national debt with someone, and I kept asking him, so if we do default on the whole national debt, who actually would suffer? I mean, whose money is this? The British government owes large amounts of money to, I don't know, National Westminster Bank. Well, if the National Westminster Bank doesn't get this money, who actually is not getting his money? Who owns this debt? And, uh, you know, we, we have no idea. No idea. Uh, large corporations, which are themselves... You have majority shareholders. The Bank of England now. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I mean, it, it may be that the national debt is not actually owed to any 
specified set of individuals. I, I'm sure we'd all suffer some kind of embarrassment if it were repudiated, but um, you know, most you know, we have a corporate um, plutocracy, and in many cases, sh majority shareholdings in quite large organizations are owned by banks and pension funds and those in turn are run by various uh, you have um, you have whole nests whole nested um, whole nested branches of corporations and it's very difficult to know who owns what remember remember all those years ago when um, when the Lloyd syndicates got into trouble and you had all these long tales where um, there'd be an earthquake in Uruguay and a syndicate in Lloyds would say, oh dear, but don't worry, we've reinsured. And so they'd pass it on to someone else in Lloyds and they'd pass it on to someone in New York they'd go on to someone in Tokyo and come back to Frankfurt. And then somehow it'd end up at the... It would just come back to the same syndicate. They were all reinsuring each other's business. Now, you know, who owns the corporate economy? It would be useful to be able to strip all of this aside and see... Yes. I think I've said enough. Uh, well, yes. I don't know whether I ought to have this gentle. Yes. You yes. it, and you'll be the last one. Yes. We'd love to uh, well, yeah. go back don't, to don't, don't, don't deny us your own objection. Oh, yes. As well. Well, if you... Yeah, yes. Okay. No, please do. Yeah. Well, first of all, I never said there was nothing like a ruling no, no, class. But, oh, but... Just saying, yeah. Get your I mean, there is a ruling well, class, yeah. but... Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what's one first? here first. First thing first. I know. Yeah, you said it's going to take one to 50 years to topple the ruling class, whatever. Uh, I think we need to hurry because a, a lot of our success is is resting on the availability of, of the internet, mm. and the, so the ruling class is doing its best in many countries to yeah. to rein it, to, mm. to put it with an end control. In, in the U.S., pretty obviously, and the U.S. tends to have supernatural national laws. France is expertly getting Sarkozy is getting control of the internet, so. I know, but I've been terrified that the internet will be shut down ever since, I, ever since I discovered it in 1993, and it hasn't been shut down yet, so I've given up worrying about it. But um, David wants to call me a romantic Tory, so... Oh, well, I have called you a romantic Tory. Go on, go on. Go on. But, oh, you mean... Uh, well, of course, I never, I never did deny that there was a ruling class. Of course there's a ruling class. Mm -hmm. But the question is, is uh, whether the Marxist class analysis... And class struggle is realistic. Mm. Of course, it's completely, utterly unrealistic. And there's another thing, I mean, which is dragging more and more, that every time Sean mentions the word, gets on my nerves no end, just like, just like a, a smoker gets on a, an ex-smoker's nerves. And this is this stupid idea, and it is utterly stupid, of <laughs> revolution. There's never been anything like a revolution. The 1640s wasn't in any way, shape, or form a revolution. Of course, as I've said, even I think one of the pieces on Sean's uh, site. One of the, uh, the, the word revolution emerged in 1688 it's and, it, and it meant exactly the same as reactionary because it went back to the status quo ante. The, the James II had brought half a revolution. The full revolution was to go back to the status quo ante, which was Charles II or something like Charles II, a Protestant king. Get rid of Catholicism, go back. To, now, so the, the terminology... Uh, uh, then was the half revolution, the full revolution, as Jeremy will see, it's from uh, geometry. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> what the French Revolution did is took it off on a tangent. So instead of you know, going to full revolution, <laughs> hey, we're, now, we're, now, we're now going to go to a new epoch. We're going to go to a new epoch. And of course, going off to a really new epoch means going on a tangent, not a, a revolution. Uh, Expletive deleted there. <laughs> but. but uh, <laughs> Yeah, this, this idea of a revolution is intrinsically stupid, uh. utterly stupid. And but that's not the only stupidity in Marx. Uh, Marx's main idea of a class struggle is the haggling over wages, wage bargaining. Even bargaining in itself helps to refute it. He's got no other example of the class struggle. We know that this is an example of uh, mutual interests. It's trade. Uh, there is a consumer interest on the one side and the producer interest on the other side, as people like Wicksteed and Marshall point out. So his very example of the class struggle is a example of mutual interests, or if you like, even common interests. It's certainly not an example of opposing interests. 
And there's no other example in of the class struggle in Marx. Well, for, for yourself, there's four volumes of it. If you can't see it, it's a surplus value. You read them. Oh, no, I've read them more than once. So I used to read it every night. I sent you to sleep. I defer to David's greater scholarship in the Marxist tradition. But well, of course, they agree with you on the state. Yeah. I mean, the, state the state. The state is the executive committee of the class struggle, but that doesn't make a difference because the feudal state didn't have a second executive committee, and the state came before the executive committee of the class struggle. So you can't have this business of class struggle without the state. And, and of course, they say, and this is just to finish off this point, they they say that when. The state, uh, that when classes disappear, the state will disappear. Bakunin saw through that. <laughs> As Hans has said, Paul. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was just wanting to say, I, I, I was hoping you'd say all that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I encourage you. He usually does. <laughs> <laughs> Very well done. That's why I encourage you. So I, I spent more than a, 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 a couple of moments thinking of a reply. <laughs> mm. uh, and the, my thoughts were these, uh, that... Um, I think you're, you're right that the, the, the dialectical material idea of class interests, uh, opposing class interests, and that is romantic. But it seems to me that there is such an ob there is an objective way, a mathematically objective way, that you can say, you know, simply saying, the, this, there's this class and this class. Yeah, you know, there's a class of people who have black hair and the class of people who don't have black hair. Yeah, you can ask that. In the same way, there's the class of people who rule. And the class of people who don't rule, and the class yes. of people, the class of people who exploit, and the class of people who don't exploit, yes. and the, the class of the oppressors. Yeah. Now, I think this is the case thing. You don't have to go down the whole uh, romantic idea of uh, dialecticism, material or otherwise, to see that there, there is that, that there are classes. And again, you don't have to abandon the idea of everybody being <coughs> open to argument to see that uh, a lot of people just simply go along with their peers and go along with their groups and go along with their friends and. This, this is how the. Of course, it's true. You, you, you will get a revel, You will get an aristocratic. You know, Wage would bend. Yes. You know, straight away. You know, you, you get an aristocrat who opposes his own class interests. You know, and the uh, the working class Tories, another example of a, a, a class that opposes their own interests in a silly Marxist way. But I don't think it's 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 not romantic to say that there are people who are brutally exploiting. The, pe the class of people who aren't brutally exploited, and it might be difficult to pick them out. You know, it's not immediately obvious that you know school teachers and uh, nurses and staff of the BBC are part of the ruling class. Oh, they're certainly not part of the ruling class. But I mean, the, the, the over but, the, well, the, well, they're they, not part of the ruling class. There is a ruling class. class. Useless, there might be useful idiots of the ruling class. There might be. They, they, they might are on a glorified door. Mm -hmm. They're on the glorified door. Exactly. exactly. That's not part of ruling class. But, 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 but That's part of the bloody exactly. London proletariat. They are part of the class of tax eaters, yeah. not part of the class of taxpayers. Yes, but they're not the ruling class. There is a ruling class, as I said in my first sentence. We know who they are. Cameron's certainly one of them. The rich people are yeah, certainly exactly. one of them. They, they don't rule rich. But, but the over, what I call the overclass, they benefit from the what I call the overclass, social workers, teachers and so on, are... Lump of proletariat. They, they, they are not. They, they're on a glorified dole. Lump and sanitarium. <laughs> lump and sanitarium. They, they're on a glorified dole. They are not part of the ruling class. Oh, they don't no, rule, you're they saying they're part of the ruling class. They That's absolutely stupid. No, no, they don't rule, but they benefit. There, there is a ruling class. They benefit from the ruling You know who they are. The they're the people in Parliament. The rulers. The ruling class is the class that, that rules. includes the rulers. So, again, a, a, a medieval earl who is on a glorified dole. He is in the ruling class, no, but he's not, not ruling, he's just taking the dog. No, 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 the, the Earl is not on a glorified doll. He's, on a, he's, a, he's obviously getting a, a fine income. Uh, when, I, when I talk... Uh, People at the BBC getting a fine income. A sinecure, uh, I mean, well, I suppose sinecures can cover both. Can cover both. But we, we, wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't call... Would you call a social worker part of the ruling class? I mean, would you call a social worker part of the ruling class? A client or an apparatchik? They have clients. I mean, the, the, yeah, so, right. the, 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 the victims is the correct word. <laughs> victims, clients. What's the difference? A client was always. This is one thing that modern business people using the word client smack in the middle of their business letters. They don't know what the word client means. It does mean a victim. Okay. Uh, with that. Yes, we ought to. We ought to stop. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Could I? Could I well done, sir. Thank you. Could I? Um, before oh. before we all leave. Yeah, you have to play. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, my friend Richard Blake. <laughs>
<laughs> this is number four. It comes out on the 16th of February, and today's the 13th, so it comes out on Thursday. Um, it has had a number of very good reviews, and it is filled with extreme violence and libertarian propaganda. There's lots of sex in it. There is, yes. Excellent. Yes. And it is only <laughs> £7.99. <laughs> Otherwise, here is one I did earlier. This is the, um, this is the Churchill Memorandum, a novel which was published to considerable acclaim last year and which unfortunately seems to have driven several people barking mad without having read it. Um, Just wait till they read it. Yeah. 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 Smoking Class and the Legitimation of Power, a very good read, I suggest. <laughs> and for those of you who don't like um, politics that much, there is a volume of literary essays here with a very pretty graphic on the front cover. It's an unfortunate um, Egyptian youth called Artemidorus who was clubbed to death in about 120 AD. And all of these are available here if you want to buy signed copies, or they're available on Amazon or um, all other good bookshops. So if anybody would like a signed copy of one of these masterpieces, I am more than happy to oblige. Thank you very much. Can you sign for Richard Blake? I have, a, <laughs> I have a signing authority for him. An enduring power of attorney. Thank you very much for doing this. It's my pleasure. My pleasure.